So first of all, what, let me ask the question, why would we modify, and this is what a lot of surgeons will say, why, why should we modify total hip replacement? It's a great operation. As I said, it's one of the most successful operations that it was ever created. About 300,000 a year are done in the United States every year, so it's pretty amazing. Um, well, the answer really is, and, and you all are, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's because that hip replacement in young people don't do as well. So to look at results, we look at registry studies. Uh, one of the most successful registries which has captured the most patients for the longest period of time is in Sweden because uh, apparently nobody moves away from Sweden. They're all in the healthcare system. <laughs> so if they have their hip done in Sweden, they're usually going to have their hip revised in Sweden. So they can compare who has revisions and who had their hip replaced in the first place and they can stratify it by data. So if you look at uh, the younger than 50 years of age, which is happening more and more for hip surgery, you see that you're going to see a curve like this over and over. It's a survival curve. So at the top is 100%. So if every hip done uh, lasted forever, it would, it would be straight across the front at 100%. But unfortunately, it fails with time. So um, it's a 61% survival from revision, meaning 40% will have a revision by 19 years after surgery. If you look at a decade later, so between 50 and 60, and a lot of you patients are there, um, it's only, it's, you know, 30% of people or one out of three will have a revision within 19 years. So, you know, it's a pretty high percentage and people are more active these days. So that is really the challenge, is doing an arthroplasty or a hip operation in these young active patients. You are the people who will pose the greatest challenge to implant longevity. Your increased activity will likely lead to an earlier need for revision surgery with a hip replacement. And I would submit to you that those implants that were designed in the 1960s were not designed for today's activities. You know, this is a, this is a patient of mine who came into me, came to me and he said, I climb, you know, ice face mountains like this. Will I be able to do this with a total hip replacement? And I would honestly say, I would have concerns. You know, if he were to slip, the leg twists one way, dislocates, he's out on that mountain. I would be worried about that. <clears throat> And we also uh, are familiar as surgeons with people who have had revisions. So this is a patient who had uh, his hip surgery done um, when he was in his early 40s. And uh, he had what was a state-of-an-art hip replacement. He had, uh, you know, a press-fit socket, cemented stem, metal on polyethylene. And unfortunately what happens with time is the polyethylene wears out and it causes inflammation and it causes bone loss. And with time, that bone loss can get worse and worse to the point that it loosens. And then he's faced basically seven years after surgery, still under 50, with a big operation like that and a big stem. And it's going to continue, unfortunately. And if, here's another picture of a young woman who had her hip replaced. And you can see the amount of wear that happens. It's not circular anymore, it's oblong. And that's because the head pushes through and you can see tremendous bone loss around here in the pelvis. And then uh, what can happen after that is you have to do something very, very invasive, massive. You see holes in the pelvis like this to reconstruct that. So that, that can happen with wear debris. Lost bone is difficult to replace and you have to do extensive reconstructive surgery. So, uh, my question is not why modify total hip, but why not modify it? So in a total hip replacement, we put in a socket, we cut away the bone, and we put in that stem device, and it does work well. But if you could achieve the same result by just sculpting the top of it to accept a cap and save all this bone in here, I, I think if we could achieve the same result, that's a better situation for the future. So at one point, hip resurfacing was the fastest growing hip operation. People were really enthusiastic in 2006 to 7. At one point in Australia, it reached 8% of all primary hip replacements. It's now about 3% as things have unfortunately unfolded. Bad implants have come on the market and be, been recalled. In the United States, we started in a large number because it was FDA approved in May of 2006. And um, I would say it's probably 2 to 3% of primary hip replacements now. Not that many surgeons are doing it. And, um, you know, patients have become more nervous about it, understandably. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very low number, actually, that's being done <clears throat> in the United States. 
To give you some history about hip resurfacing, you may come to surgeons who say, oh, we tried that in the 70s, it didn't work well. Um, just to explain it, you know, the materials were different. So this is Dr. Amstutz, who I trained with, and uh, he had the concept of saving as much bone as possible. Um, he, he made an implant that was metal on plastic. He cemented both of them in place. Um, unfortunately, the materials of the time really couldn't withstand the forces on the hip. And um, often they had to remove a lot of bone in order to get that plastic socket in. So they didn't do very well, unfortunately. And that's the experience that has colored a lot of older surgeons away from doing this operation. So early f failures were from a fracture such as this. Uh, later failures were from loosening of the cemented pieces and osteolysis, which is that plastic wear. And uh, basically you had a survival curve that looked like this at a pretty short time. So that uh, at you know, seven to eight years, you know, 50% were lost. So that, that wasn't a good result. And I think the concept was still sound, but unfortunately the materials didn't work at that time. And uh, you know, despite the problem, some of the patients, you know, even 16 years out, had a really good preservation of bone, good function, and it was a worthwhile thing for some patients. And that led him to keep it alive, and then basically it was reinvigorated uh, by Derek McMinn, who some of you may have met last year, and he's obviously an amazing guy. But I think there have been three major changes to have improved the outcome of hip resurfacing. And one is the implant materials and design. That's both the strength and the Achilles heel of resurfacing, which is the metal. Uh, improved instrumentation, meaning the way we do it, the things that we use to guide our positioning, are, I think are better. And then I think we have developed improved surgical technique. We have more understanding of the anatomy, the blood supply, how to preserve that, and uh, I think that has translated to better results. And this was a paper in 2008 coming out from the UK where their survival rate at eight years compared to where it was 55% failure in that last slide, you have basically 3% you know, failure. So um, this, these are the main changes I think have, which have helped. Um, <clears throat> most implants look like this, whether it's a Birmingham or a Conserve Plus or um, <clears throat> a, a Cormet. They have a short stem which helps us position it right that wasn't present in the last the first generation. We generally cement this, but we'll talk about uncemented as well. And then the socket is press fit, so it's not cemented anymore. We don't have to remove as much bone. It's more durable in terms of the fixation. So those are the three things, I think, which have changed as well. The metal on metal, as I said, can be very good, but it can also be very bad. Uh, most of the material is it's high carbide, cobalt chromium. It's very resistant to wear, has good wear properties. The material is hard enough that it can be made very spherical and the machining processes are better today. It's more highly polished. And all of this leads to what we call a fluid film lubrication. And uh, that's basically what we're trying to achieve is a very, very low friction situation. Here's a uh, implant which is taken out of the box. You can see and you guys have probably seen the implant over and over, but it's a very, very smooth, smooth running surface and uh, generally if it's well lubricated, put in right, it works really well.